All right, well, thank you very much for those of you who are staying. You're diehards, okay? You, you must be desperate to learn something about financial systems and you know, open source and distributed systems. Great. <clears throat> um, I've, I've been very fortunate in my career in that uh, having worked for a variety of different organizations, um, I had the, the chance to uh, travel the world. And I think that the, the, the best place in terms of attendance is always China. So you go on a Sunday to a university, and you do a presentation, you get 500 students. Where in the world would you get 500 students turning up on a Sunday? You know, only China. So, OK, so um, I've got some slides to show you. And uh, the deck that you'll be able to access from the um, organizer's website actually has some more case studies and things. But what I wanted to show you was some demos as well, just to uh, reinforce the points that I'm trying to make. So we will cover a, a case study for a large uh, bank uh, that's using uh, Ignite and um, uh, talk about some of their sort of uh, problems, if you like, five main issues that they have and how the technology has helped them solve those issues. And uh, uh, the rest of it, I, I think, you know, as I said, I've, I've trimmed it down a little bit so that uh, we keep it uh, relevant and useful to you. All right, then. OK, so we've got a fairly simple agenda, then. So we'll cover a little bit on Ignite and grid gain, and then we'll do a deep dive into the main challenges faced by Spurbank, which is the bank in question. So they are a major Eastern European and Russian bank. Um, span something like 11 time zones. They have a presence in 22 countries. And uh, so they've got some major issues that they've uh, been experiencing in terms of what they want to do with technology and uh, where they want to be. And so this um, distributed sort of systems uh, approach has helped them considerably in, uh, uh, in terms of their uh, needs. OK, so quickly then, Ignite and grid gain. So uh, Apache Ignite is the open source uh, project available from the Apache Software Foundation. So ignite.apache.org. Okay, I'll show you the website a little bit later on. There's some things that uh, are useful there and uh, worth having a look at. Um, grid gain is the company originally behind the development of Ignite and uh, open sourced it some years ago through the uh, Apache Software Foundation. So they are the company that developed this technology about nine, 10 years ago. And so there is a, a little bit of a difference then. So it's important to understand the difference. So Ignite, memory central points there. OK, so in terms of the big picture, then this architecturally kind of uh, sums it up, if you like. So if we look um, across the middle there, we see this memory centric storage scale to thousands of nodes and store terabytes of data. Um, and the other thing is that because there's now integration with Zookeeper, you can really literally scale to many, many thousands of nodes if you really want uh, scale to, to reach that sort of level. Um, and historically, then, the, the caching aspect of it, the, um, the reason this technology came about was to solve two problems. Okay? So first, scale. Scale is achieved because it's cluster computing. You just add more resources as you need them. Um, and the second thing, performance. Okay? And the performance is achieved because of the ability to cache data in memory and run at memory speeds. Okay? So that's really useful. Now, what's happened over time, particularly with Ignite, is that uh, more features and capabilities have been added. So if we look in the bottom left-hand corner there, um, we can see Ignite native persistence. So Ignite can now save data and state. It can be a system of record. <clears throat> no longer do you need to just cache things in memory. If you really want to add persistence, it's very easy to enable it. It can be done through one line of code, for example, in your Java program, or through an XML configuration file, which each node kind of picks up. Um, and this is useful in those scenarios, for example, where you're dealing with very large quantities of data. So you may have tens of terabytes of data. Not all of that is going to fit into memory. And so Ignite can page in. Uh, data into memory, okay, first in, first out, or we can use other <coughs> uh, techniques to, to uh, um, you know, where, where data are not being used to read things that you need. And therefore, this is a, a very useful feature. So the ability to handle larger quantities of data, and again, the ability to really extend the capabilities of the in-memory. Um, now, there's another benefit as well, of course, that if your cluster is running, 
uh, let's say you have a massive power outage and or you know say an asteroid or something hits your data center if you're running in memory then of course everything goes down you know you've lost it uh, state and data is gone um, with this persistence capability, because it uses logging and partition files, each node managing a small part of the overall data, in the event that something catastrophic happens, it's much, much easier to bring the cluster up again. And this is one of the things that uh, Spurbank, it's a major requirement for them because they have very stringent kind of SLAs, which we'll get to a little bit later on. Uh, another thing that uh, Ignite does, if we look in the bottom right-hand corner there, third-party persistence. So this is kind of a useful feature. So um, a key point, uh, if you like, um, that uh, Ignite uh, is sort of positioned in, uh, you know, the, the space that they're trying to really address is this uh, kind of no rip and replace. So the idea is that probably uh, you are using systems that you are... Uh, invested time, money, effort in over a long period of time. You know, typically, these may be relational systems, transactional systems, but it can work with other things as well, HDFS, NoSQL as well. But let's uh, consider the scenario where you're working with the transactional database systems, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, um, you know, DB2, and so on. So in these cases, what Ignite can do is it can take schema information, it can take data, it can cache that in memory, Using the power of the cluster, it can parallelize operations, it can run operations at memory speeds. Okay, so this is really a benefit. And I'll give you an example. So earlier this year, I was in Brussels and I was presenting at a Java user group. And there was a gentleman who came up to me at the end and he said that we are a big Postgres user. Uh, and he said, we like the product very much. It solves the, you know, many of our business problems, but there are some cases where performance is, is poor. And we, we're trying to address those uh, type of scenarios. And in this situation, they are using Ignite to really offload that processing to the cluster, run those operations at memory speeds, and they're seeing vast improvements and the ability to really do the kind of things that they, they want to do with that data. OK. so. Just above the memory-centric storage, then, we see a, a range of uh, um, grids, if you like, or features, capabilities. So starting from the left-hand side, SQL. Now, the thing is, uh, whether you like it or you hate it, SQL is intergalactic data speak. Okay? There's no escaping that. So the vast majority of BI tools, very easy to plug them in if you need them. Uh, the other thing is, of course, skills availability. If you need a good SQL developer, it's very, very easy to find one. Um, Ignite is a key value store. Okay? There are other great key value stores out there as well, but again, you know, historically, this product has been around for quite a long time, and uh, key value was one of the original kind of strengths and features that they introduced, and the value can be anything. Uh, and uh, so you can be using simple types, character, in, integer, floating point, string, uh, whatever, or these can be user-defined complex types. So things like, say, a financial instrument or a healthcare record, okay? and then as deep as you want, okay? as deep as the programming language will support. It does transactions, um, and it does the two types of transactions. So it does both lock-based ACID transactions, and it does the lock-free optimistic transactions. <coughs> Excuse me. And let me give you an example of why these are useful. So consistency is something that we look for, in, uh, uh, particularly in, in database management systems, that system moves from one consistent state to another consistent state. In between, of course, whilst the transaction is running, perhaps some level of inconsistency does occur. But when we commit, either it's successful and we're okay, or there is some error or some problem and we have to roll back, back to a known state. Um, I'm a great fan of MOOCs, massive open online courses. So earlier this year, I was on the website of one of these providers. As you know, there's Coursera, EDX, Udemy, Udacity, many, many of them around. And uh, I happened to like a particular course. So I got my credit card out, I put the details in, hit the pay button, and it came back and said, there is an error. All right, I thought, transaction didn't complete, not a problem. A while later, I checked my credit card bill, and I noticed I've actually been charged. So I go to the merchant, they say, we haven't received the money, we haven't been paid. I go to the bank and they say, you've paid for this. Where's the money? Okay? Now there's an example of a poorly designed system. That should not happen. Okay? If I want to transfer 100 euros from my bank account to your bank account, 
My bank account needs to be correctly debited. Your bank account needs to be correctly credited. So there is a situation, you know, it's an atomic unit of work. Either all of it happens or none of it happens. So Ignite will guarantee these ACID operations. And the other thing is that one of the things that it does, when, particularly when working with these third-party persistence capabilities and transactional-based systems, typically relational, but some NoSQL products are transactional as well, the thing is that Ignite will keep its cash and the back-end system consistent. Okay? You don't have to manage that. It will take care of that for you. Um, other things, compute and services. Unfortunately, no time to cover these today. Uh, streaming, and it will happily connect with streaming technology, Spark Streaming, Flink. You saw the previous speaker talking about that. And um, uh, there's uh, Kafka, all of these. There are adapters and connectors for all of these technologies. And so one of the benefits that Ignite brings is that it has this data streamers, OK? So it can take the data, parallelize it amongst the cluster, and then we have the opportunity to run operations uh, in parallel upon this uh, data. And of course, the data can be finite, maybe coming in and stop at some point, or it can be continuous. And the other thing is that, particularly with continuous data, we can do things like complex event processing. So we can say, all right, you know, I'm interested, say, in the last five minutes worth of data, or I'm interested in the last uh, 100 events or whatever. These things are supported and uh, perfectly doable. Um, and machine learning as well. So machine learning was really driven by one of the major users of Ignite out there, because previously the problem was that if you want to do some of this capability upon the data that you have in your cluster, you have to offload it, ETL, you know, take it out, use third-party tools on it, do some analysis, and then you get some results. Now, if you, you know, for small quantities of data, that's doable. It works, okay? But once you scale up, you've got terabytes, petabytes of data, enormous amounts of uh, uh, you know, uh, data to, to manage, it becomes really hard. And therefore, the ability to run these operations, uh, machine learning algorithms in place on the data that you have is a real benefit. Again, we'll, we'll touch upon this a little bit later on. Okay, so um, generally my focus as uh, someone that works for uh, GridGain, uh, it's purely open source. However, from time to time, it's worth just mentioning a few things. And so if we look here, here is the key difference that uh, the commercial GridGain has versus the open source Apache Ignite. Okay, so there's a few things, and it's the kind of uh, uh, you know, Red Hat model. Essentially, the software is given away for free, and you have uh, some additional services around that, you know, professional services, training, bug fixes at enterprise level, plus a few enterprise features. And these are the kind of enterprise features that Spurbank in particular utilize. So if we look at this, um, things like data snapshots and recovery, okay? So there's sort of point in time recovery, the ability that, uh, yes, you may take a snapshot of your system, say, on the hour, every hour, but let's say you want to take incremental snapshots as well. You know, every couple of minutes you take a snapshot. In the event there's some failure, you can recover back to some point in time. That's a, an enterprise feature. Monitoring and management, security and auditing, um, more sort of uh, stringent requirements than may be available in the uh, open source product. And then data center replication. So uh, being a large commercial bank, they run this technology across three main data centers around the world. Uh, and again, for allow you know, acts of God, nature, problems, you know, power outages, uh, serious uh, sort of issues that may take down one or more of these data centers. So it's important for them to have this ability at a sort of commercial scale that they need. Beyond that, though, I mean, the, the basic open source technology actually does quite a lot as well. So it's, you can start from that if you want, and then if you find that there are some commercial features you need, obviously I would suggest you talk to GridGain. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, some of these uh, challenges, okay? And then if time allows, I've got a uh, little bit under sort of 20 minutes or so to, f to finish this. I'll show you a couple of demos, you know, some simple sort of uh, examples of uh, some of the, th the things that I've talked about, uh, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so uh, Spurbank itself, core banking services at scale. So essentially what they are in the situation is that uh, basically they pay some of these larger organizations uh, huge amounts of licensing fees. So they want to move away from that. 
Um, they want to also redevelop a lot of their services and systems to take account for a lot of the new technologies that are coming out there. Now, we've all got smartphones, okay? And we all do banking on our smartphones. I I'm kind of late to it. I mean, I started very late. Uh, my wife was a lot quicker than I was, but I found it very, very useful. You know, the ability to transfer money, to pay bills, all of these kind of capabilities. And of course, that if you are a, a major organization with millions of customers, you know, and thousands of branches, um, historically, uh, reinventing and introducing these new services, getting a better idea of what your customers are doing, and getting this kind of 360 degree view of, of the customer is really what they're trying to achieve. So that they can target specific services at specific customers um, and make it more personalized for them. It's hard. And so a lot of what they want to do is to replace the existing technology and bring in a lot of this new technology. And things like cluster computing give them that capability, again, for those two reasons that I mentioned earlier, scale and performance. So scale, again, just add more resources as you need them, and remove them when you don't need them. And the performance, they utilize the memory capability very efficiently and very effectively. Uh, but equally, they, uh, because of the amount of data that they deal with and some of the SLAs they, they, they deal with, um, it's important to have that persistence capability as well, which we touched on uh, a couple of slides ago. OK, so what does their uh, actual system look like? So if you are familiar with this, Cheyenne, um, one of the biggest uh, sort of supercomputer clusters, uh, essentially their system is architected and looks a little bit like this, okay? So this thing, you know, 4,000 nodes, 300 terabytes of RAM, 50 petabytes of disk, and uh, there's a link there which actually goes into a lot more detail about de describing this particular system. So they've got uh, huge amounts of data, okay, comparable to this, um, and equally they trying to manage a, a lot of it in RAM, keep uh, much of it in memory as possible, but because of some of the reasons I stated a little bit earlier, uh, it is important for recovery and other purposes. The persistence really does uh, aid them in this. Okay, so the first thing then, challenge number one, large memory size. So uh, typically they're dealing with reasonably large amounts of memory, about a terabyte per server, which uh, in these monetary terms these days is pretty affordable. Uh, memory is cheap. Uh, the other thing is that um, Ignite, being a Java-based product, obviously there are issues in terms of garbage collection, okay? On heap, off heap, as you know. And uh, therefore, particularly with Ignite, they re rewritten some parts of it so that it utilizes its own memory management system, does not rely upon Java. That would be a problem with large amounts of memory, okay? Because these things like stop the world garbage collection can have a serious impact upon performance, okay? So on heap is not an option. Um, off heap as the primary storage as well, okay? So they need something else in addition, okay? So the ability to use um, uh, off-heap memory, memory management is really going to assist them and help them in this respect. And if we look at the durable memory that um, Ignite provides, so off-heap removes uh, noticeable GC pauses, okay, one of the key benefits that they get, automatic defragmentation, some of these other features, okay, uh, predictable memory consumption, okay, so these are helpful, okay, in large deployment deployments and environments, we want to get some sense of how the system is performing, where we can tweak and where we can tune it, and getting at some understanding of how it's behaving it is really, really helpful. Um, now, the other thing is that if you look at some of those points there, so full transactional write-ahead log and uh, instantaneous restart. So this goes back to that persistence capability that I talked about a little bit earlier on. So in this scenario, Ignite is no longer behaving just as a cache, okay? It behaves as a system of record, as a distributed database system that persists data, okay? And, and so the write ahead logs are used for recovery purposes. Each node manages some small part of the overall data, and it's got partition files which keep that data as well. And so, like some other systems, it avoids in-place updates because they are slow, right? So we write these changes to a write-ahead log. Sometime later, we flush these changes to the system, shrink the size of the log, and you know this is uh, and rotate it, and this is how it, it handles these scenarios. Um, store superset of data on disk. So in this, uh, again, with this native persistence capability, what they're able to do then is that all of the data are stored on disk, okay? 
Some of the data may be cached, uh, and that's entirely up to Ignite based upon its strategies in terms of uh, uh, how it reads in data. And again, there's some tuning and configuration that you can do with that. But this is, is you know, this durable memory um, is the idea that uh, you are persisting data now, not just caching it anymore. All right, so some useful things there that the bank has found and been able to apply directly for some of the problems that they see. Um, challenge number two, instantaneous restart. So they have a pretty stringent requirement. Now, with all the vast quantities of data that they have and the size of the cluster that they have, they have uh, this requirement that in the events that things fail and failures happen, you know, um, it, it's the nature of life and, the, and um, we see these problems um, occurring from time to time. Uh, Five-minute SLA, all right? Now, with memory-only systems, if we lose everything, uh, let's say through a power outage, our entire cluster goes down, it's going to take some time to rebuild that data for them. It's going to take time to load all that da data in and whatever you know, processing that we're doing, perform some, some level of recovery upon that. It's slow. It's going to take time. Um, far better to have this capability to, uh, you know, with the logging and the partition files that are maintained, persisting the data means that we can bring that cluster up a lot faster. Um, that's very, very useful. Okay. Cannot wait for data loading, need to operate from disk, and therefore this is a, a significant sort of benefit that they found, and they are actually one of the driving forces behind this capability that Ignite has added. They specifically requested this, and because they are a large customer and, and have a, a huge sort of user base and uh, in terms of uh, the, the scale that they operate in, you know, naturally this is something that uh, eventually came to, be, came to pass. Um, so we've touched upon this a little bit already. Um, so each node uh, maintains a write-ahead log, okay, and also partition files where we keep some parts of the uh, overall database. And if you are familiar with database recovery systems, you know, you've worked with relational systems or other types of database management systems, I mean, this should look fairly, uh, you know, it, it should be fairly obvious to you and uh, uh, reasonably understandable. There, there's not, uh, the, you know, this is not kind of reinventing things that we don't know about. Um, all of these are using tried and trusted uh, uh, techniques that have been around for a very, very long time if you've worked with the database management systems. There's a lot of detail about this as well. If you want to know the nitty-gritty of how they actually implemented it, there's an entire wiki that goes into the, the, the depths and the descriptions of how this is actually supported at a very, very low level. Okay? So if you're interested in the details, happy to uh, um, uh, help you out and point you to those resources. Okay, challenge number three, huge data model. So one of the things, uh, again, through various uh, legislation, historical requirements, uh, you know, legal requirements is the fact that uh, um, they need to keep track of products that they've offered in the past, and therefore sometimes, you know, things are versioned. They have to keep all these different versions. And a lot of these uh, uh, sort of older products, if you like, uh, you know, when we are doing this versioning, that inevitably that leads to a large number of data types as well that we have to think about. Things may change over time. Things get versioned. We may not use the same types in the new product that we did in the previous product. All of these changes have to be maintained so that at some point in time, if for legal reasons they need to go back in time and to, to show how things were at some point, uh, they can do that. Okay? So that's very, very important. Uh, fast replication and partitioning, again, the idea of cluster computing helping them in, in terms of achieving these sort of capabilities. Uh, one of the nice things that you get with Ignite, which is a benefit and also available in other types of distributed systems, is this idea of co-located processing, for example. So data that has some association with other data has a, in a kind of a natural um, affinity, if you like, and we can store that data together. That means that we are bringing the processing to the data. We are storing that data together. Uh, it helps us achieve better performance because we don't have to search across our cluster anymore. Um, we know exactly where that data resides. Uh, distributed SQL joins. So because Ignite supports SQL, SQL 99, that yes, you know, if um, 
Joins are the, probably the most expensive operation in a relational database system. But again, the system can keep statistics, it can keep uh, you know, useful information about um, uh, data sizes, you know, the tables, uh, access patterns, indexes, all of this information is available to it, and therefore it, it makes the you know, good optimizers make great decisions in terms of what's the best approach to uh, retrieve data. Uh, there's nothing to stop you doing a distributed join across an Ignite cluster. Now, if you do it badly, you, know, you will bring the system to its knees. That's life, unfortunately. No, it's one of the things that you get. There's great flexibility and great opportunity on the one hand, but equally use it with care. Okay? I mean, there's nothing to stop you doing it. Ignite will not prevent you from doing it, but um, this is part of the overall architectural decisions that you make and the types of queries that you run, the access patterns, and again, using these kind of co-location capabilities. So, you know, They've uh, chosen wisely in terms of how they use these uh, distributed SQL joins. So can be done, okay, um, but obviously used with, uh, with care and caution. The co-located processing we already talked about, very, very useful uh, feature. And uh, again, helps in terms of boosting performance. And uh, there are some demos and things that show Ignite's capabilities in this space. Uh, you know, the, you could get some sense of what sort of performance benefits that you can achieve. Um, so in terms of the distributed SQL then, so we've talked about uh, SQL 99, I've mentioned, um, old DDL and DML feature support, okay? So uh, if you are working with uh, the, the three kind of primary languages that Ignite supports, which is Java, .NET, and C++, these are the kind of the top level languages, um, there is this binary format that's used that you can use to store in one language, for example, and retrieve in another. Uh, and that is something within large organizations that you often find that different departments, different parts of your uh, company may be working with different programming language, different, different frameworks. That happens, okay? So Ignite provides some flexibility. Now, there is support for additional things coming down the road. Okay? There is a REST-based interface as well, very, very useful. Uh, but things like, for example, if you're a data scientist, you're, you're working with things like Python uh, or R or, or those kind of technologies, then there are these kind of thin drivers being developed for those. Uh, the next big thing that's being added, certainly as far as the machine learning capabilities and deep learning capabilities, is TensorFlow support, which is coming in 2.7, release is kind of almost imminent. Um, Indexes in RAM or disk, dynamic scaling, so all the cap capabilities that we would expect of cluster computing in terms of failover and, and uh, uh, recovery, um, the ability to scale up and down as we need it, that's all supported. It's a standard stuff. Um, compute grid, okay, so this was one of the things that we saw a little bit early on. So how this works is if you're familiar with fork join or map reduce, it's exactly the same um, approach here, that uh, divide and conquer, okay? So we have something that comes in, some compute uh, uh, task, we break that down. In this case, for example, we've got a cluster of two machines and it will do it in half the time. I mean, that's, uh, uh, again, machines of equal capability. But one of the things that Ignite can do, again, is recognize where resources are being underutilized. So where machines have additional power, additional processing capability available, Ignite will be able to use that uh, and be able to perform um, you know, operations on those. Uh, okay, so the machine learning. Um, so uh, Spurbank was one of the drivers behind this, again, because uh, to work with enormous amounts of data and then not have the capability to run sort of in-place operations covering uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, it's a big bind. I mean, you have to do ETL. There's no, really no choice. So the opportunity to really uh, work with machine learning on the data that you have to do your analytics, to be able to do things like fraud detection, for example, very, very important um, in real time, is very, very helpful to them. And so what they've done with Ignite is these algorithms have been implemented from the bottom to take advantage of distributed processing, large-scale parallelization, and uh, again, there are some features that they've added, things like uh, partition-based uh, data sets. So the idea here is that if you're running a machine learning job, and let's say it's been going for half an hour, and perhaps it may need another half an hour uh, to complete, if you lose some parts of your cluster, for example, 
The thing is that the, the job will still continue. It's able to process that data because of these uh, uh, additional sort of features uh, that they've built in. Um, because typically for machine learning, it's an iterative process. And typically, you have uh, this notion of data and state. Uh, and uh, uh, as algorithms iterate, things change, okay? And you want to pre preserve where you've reached in, in the particular sort of run of an algorithm to be able to recover from that. So Ignite will happily do that for you. Right? Okay, so no ETL. Okay, backups and snapshots. Uh, need to backup data, consistent data restore, restore on different clusters. So these are a few of the enterprise features now we're starting to get into, okay? So that, uh, again, the needs of enterprises, uh, sometimes you have maybe a cluster of a different size. Perhaps you want to restore the data to that very, very quickly, and one of the enterprise features allows you to do this. Um, Backups, of course, are important. You know, uh, even when we're running with persistence capability enabled, we may still need to uh, ensure that uh, uh, we've got adequate backups. You know, if you work with relational systems, for example, or any type of database technology, you know that these type of things uh, are done on a regular basis. Uh, we need, uh, again, support for this. And so these things. Snapshots and recovery. So snapshots, think of them as like sort of database uh, um, backups, if you like, and the ability to rec recover from external storage, uh, your cluster to a sort of a, a known state. And again, point in time recovery as well. Very, very important. And I'll give you an example of why, why this is relevant. So not with this particular bank, but another example that I've heard of. Um, we are human. We make mistakes. Developers make mistakes, okay? And so there was a case where a developer wrote a SQL query set all the bank balances for this particular organization to zero. All customers' balances were set to zero, okay? So the ability to go back just before this problem, re restore the system to a point in time, very, very quickly the bank realized what the problem was and be able to recover that, very useful capability. And particularly if you're working across lots of time zones, you know, you have uh, um, a need to keep customers happy, you need to, to have the system fully operational. These, again, are, are very uh, key features to uh, um, enterprises. Uh, the last thing here is um, data center replication. So if I uh, probably be best illustrate it with a, a graphic like this. I mean, this is, do this is not actually the Spurbank um, where they've got their data center. I think we're not allowed to tell you where they are uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but the way that these things can work is typically if you can have just clusters and they may work in a variety of different ways in terms of how you do your replication. So it can be active-active, for example, or active-passive. You may just have a backup, for example, where the data are being replicated to that. So in the event the primary goes down, um, the data comes back up again. But you know, if you've got active-active, then there's more data flowing between these. You know, it's, again, architectural decisions based upon uh, uh, needs, and so it, there's a sort of uh, a lot of configuration that you can do in this space. Uh, one other thing that's worth pointing out, that if you're familiar with the CAP theorem, and sometimes people ask this, you know, this consistency, availability, partition tolerance, the idea that oh, you can only have two of these uh, at any one time, you know, in a distributed environment, it's hard to get all three of them, or impossible to get all three of them, so uh, people say, then it's worth adding here that um, Ignite does the C and the A, okay? So it's consistent uh, and available, um, and therefore the, the partition tolerance, uh, you know, it, there's things that we can do to mitigate that and, 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 and help with that uh, as well. But um, we need to think about these uh, scenarios. Okay, so uh, a little bit in terms of the numbers then, just to uh, the last sort of couple of minutes that I have left uh, available. So these are numbers from the Apache Software Foundation. Okay, so we are number one in terms of the developer mailing list, number two as far as the user mailing list is concerned, and only Hadoop, Ambari, and Camel are ahead of us in terms of overall number of commits. So typically each year is about a million downloads per year. Um, and so the community is very active and uh, uh, it's worldwide, okay, and I would encourage you to participate and get involved. Uh, okay, so as I promised, a couple of things that I can show you in the last couple of minutes that I have, and we leave time for one or two questions if you have them. So uh, let me just show you this, first of all. Okay, so this is the uh, landing page at the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, if, if I can try and... Does that work? 
No, it doesn't. Not, not on here. OK, sorry about that. Um, I think we're not able to see this page. Um, can we switch to the, uh, I think the, the, your AV is designed to just handle the PowerPoint slides, but won't show the, unless I uh, go back here and say share my desktop. Let's, let's try the uh, uh, display. There may be an option here. Um, arrangement, mirror display. Let's try that, see if that works. OK, that works. Great. All right, there we go. All right, so if we just have a look here, there we go. OK, so this is the uh, landing page. And, uh, and again, let me try this. OK, that works now, this time. Great. So there we go. So in the top there, you can see screencasts. OK, so there's a couple of uh, 10 minutes of your time, <clears throat> a couple of videos that show you how you can take <clears throat> a relational system. The example they use is MySQL, for example. Ignite can read in the schema. It can generate all the plumbing, the infrastructure for you. It creates a project. Just read that project into your IDE. And then you can just put your credentials in, the port number, the IP address of the server. And it will happily work with that. Take the data from there, cache it. And your cluster can be as big or as small as you want. Okay? And then the ability to process that data at memory speeds. Any changes that are made in its cache automatically propagated to the back end as well. Okay? The two are kept consistent. Okay? That's a major feature. Um, other stuff, so let me just uh, quickly show you the, uh, let's minimize this, okay, so that our, our eyes are a little bit, uh, um, let's close this and then just show you this, okay, so if you have the opportunity, you can just download the, uh, <coughs> this is uh, 2.6, okay, so this is uh, the uh, binary version and all I have on my system is just Java. That, that's all it needs. And this will work pretty much anywhere. So it will work on uh, um, uh, you know, even um, these uh, small sort of uh, type of microprocessors you know, that you get, um, Raspberry Pis. Uh, there's an ARM-based version of Java for them. Ignite will happily work in that environment. And so lots of examples. So all of the sort of capabilities we talked about, key value, uh, persistence, machine learning examples, uh, there's genetic algorithms, for example, and lots of other code examples, and all of this stuff works standalone. You don't need a cluster to get this uh, working. All you do is just uh, read in the pom.xml file. It will create the project for you. And then just lastly to wrap up, uh, let me just show you one other thing, uh, which is this here. Okay, So if you are working with Kubernetes, for example, then Ignite will happily work in that environment as well. Okay, so this is just uh, running locally in uh, Minikube. I've got two pods here, and if we just have a look at this and look at the logs, for example, this will show us that uh, we've got Ignite running as a service inside this containerized environment. Great for DevOps guys. Okay, now you can deploy this anywhere you want. Okay, whether it's an external cloud or internal cloud, a combination of the two if you want. Um, and so this is a, a great, because we've got a standard set of commands in terms of managing this environment, and we can deploy it wherever we want. That's very, very helpful. Um, so overall, I think the message here is that um, the bank has benefited significantly from a lot of these capabilities. They've been a major driving force for adding some of the new features, for example, the persistence and the machine learning, very much driven by these large customers who wanted these capabilities that Ignite previously didn't support. And you can treat Ignite as a system of record as well now, if you want to... Uh, uh, run it in that way. Um, and the other key message is the no rip and replace, which is very, very important because it provides the ability to maintain your investment in, in what you're already using, but perhaps use Ignite to handle certain types of uh, use cases or certain types of um, problems which performance may be an issue with your existing system, but you can offload that now to cluster computing and be able to run things there at memory speeds. Okay, so I think I'm almost out of time there. Maybe I think time for one question, perhaps two. Uh, I'll be around uh, outside as well. If you want to reach out to me, just do a search on my name. I'm on LinkedIn. You know, feel free to reach out and connect uh, if you wish to do so. I'm on Twitter as well. And uh, I think, uh, um, let me just have a look. Uh, as I said before, yeah, this is a great place to go to. The community is very active, very lively. Get involved. Any questions that you have, no matter how complex or how simple, don't be afraid to ask. Great, thank you. So, question. 
Hello. Um, you, your profile said you're a global rock star. What's your favorite band? <laughs> Too many to say. Uh, I like Eric Clapton. So. <laughs> Done? All right. So, all right, guys, thank you very much for your time. As I said, I'll be around, so grab me, drop me an email, firstname.lastname at gridgain.com, and uh, that will reach me. Great. Thank you very much for your attention.